Film, gaming, pop culture, welcome to the first episode of Everything is Permitted. I'm your host, Julian Brown, alongside my co-host, Matt Rappert. Matt, it's uh, it's exciting to be podcasting. Yeah, absolutely. I've been uh, looking forward to this for a while now, so I'm excited to do all this. Yep, this has been, a uh, for me, a dream project for, for many, many years. Uh, just a little bit of an introduction for uh, myself. Uh, this is my fourth foray into podcasting. My first was a, uh, a little show called the Pegasus Galaxy Podcast, which was on a, a Stargate Atlantis message board. Um, I did it on a little <laughs> Microsoft Windows mic on my bed. It was, uh, it was, <laughs> it was quite the something. Um, after that, uh, where Matt and I aren't just nerds, we're huge soccer fans. Uh, Matt didn't do this show with me, but I uh, recorded 75 episodes of a show called the Soccer Desk Podcast. And then uh, more recently, I did a little something for Princeton University, and now I'm finally uh, doing this alongside Matt. Uh, we've been talking about this for for months now. Yeah, a few months. It's been a, it's been a while. I don't even remember when we started talking about. It, to be honest with you, it, it's been it's been a while. Um, we are so excited to be doing this on the show. Like we said at the beginning, games, film, pop culture, TV. You know, a little bit of comic news in there. We're just going to be talking about. You know what? What's current? What's going on? We're going to hit some topics tonight. We're talking about the influx of streaming services. Uh, we recorded a great segment on that with our good friend Rick. Yep. And then I also sat down with my good friends Mark and Chris to do a demo of the brand new Transformers uh, collectible card game from Hasbro. Uh, we did a video demo followed by a segment you'll hear on this show today, doing first reactions. And I also sat down with my wife Karen Brown who is also a fellow nerd and the mother of dragons, <laughs> uh, talking about Ruby Rose being cast as Batwoman. Uh, a lot to look forward to. Matt, what are you looking forward to most about you know doing this show? Um, honestly, I'm just excited to see like what we can do. I mean, I've never done a podcast myself, and you know, I God knows I never shut up about nerd <laughs> stuff. So I mean, you know, I'm excited to talk about anything nerdy, you know, in pop culture and gaming and any, you know, even in comics, even though I don't have as much of a background there. So, I mean, I'm just, you know, kind of looking forward to seeing what different topics we can talk about, to be totally honest with you. Yep, me too. And we'll be doing a few segments uh, every other week. This is going to be a bi-weekly podcast dropping every Tuesday. And one of the first segments that we're going to do on every show is called the permitted minute. <laughs> we have a sheet of headlines here that we are going to try and get through in just one minute. And if we don't, well, we'll try to do better next time. So, with that, it's time for the, the permitted, permitted minute. minute. Oh, yeah. Let's go. Let's do it. Minute is starting now. Mr. Gata, start the clock. Doctor Who Season 11 writers have been announced. Uh, these include Mallory Blackman, Ed Heim, Vinay Patel, Pete McTie, and Joe, uh, sorry, Joy Wilkinson. A lot of different writers this time around for uh, jo uh, Jody, who's going to be playing the Doctor on the most recent season. Also, Riri Williams, better known as Ironheart in Marvel Comics, who took up the mantle for Tony Stark, is going to be getting her own recurring season. Uh, from Marvel. This has been slated for November. The Punisher Season 2 finished filming recently. We could be seeing the show later in 2018 or in early 2019. John Bernthal was seen on the set sported, sporting a bloody Punisher vest. In previous from Marvel's Return of Wolverine, I can't wait! Logan, who has been dead in comics for the past couple of years, is sporting an entirely new look. An almost black ninja suit with a purple trim. I don't know how long that's going to last. <laughs> Chris Hemsworth was recently interviewed talking about being a bit let down by the second Thor installment, Thor the Dark World, calling the film meh. A bit of an understatement. The and that's it. Oh, the permitted didn't... minute is over. Damn, didn't get it. Time is a luxury you don't have at all. See six or seven headlines. Maybe you can't do them all uh, in maybe, a minute. But maybe that's not. the point. We're going to try and get them in as fast as possible. All right. Well... Coming up on our show, our first segment, I'm going to be talking to, like we mentioned earlier, my wife, Karen Brown, about Ruby Rose's casting as Batwoman in the Arrowverse. After that, we'll be sitting down with Mark and Chris doing our first reactions to Transformers, and then Matt will be back on the show. We'll be talking with our buddy Rick Salvi about the crazy amount of streaming services hitting your devices <laughs> these days, and whether that is a good thing or a bad thing for cord cutters. All that and more on this very first episode of Everything is Permitted. We're excited. Stick around.
Welcome back to Everything is Permitted, and I am now joined by my wife, fellow nerd, mother of dragons, <laughs> Karen Brown. Welcome to the show. Hi, good to be here. Podcasting with me again. Yeah, it's been a while. It has been a while. Very excited <laughs> to be doing it again. Today we are talking about the Batwoman casting for the CW. Uh, she's going to be one of the main players in the upcoming um, big crossover event that the CW does every year with Arrow, The Flash, Legends of Tomorrow, and Supergirl. Batwoman, uh, aka Kate Kane, getting her own show based off of uh, her character that she'll be portraying in this um, big crossover event. And uh, not only is she going to be getting her own show, she is going to be the first televised leading superhero character who is out and LGBT. Very cool. Karen, when you got the news of this, you immediately texted me and said, did you see the Batwoman casting? Uh, You were very excited. Um, What do you know? Who is Kate Kane? Why are you so excited about Ruby Rose specifically being casted? So Kate Kane is cool in the superhero universe because she her being a lesbian has become a really big part of her character it's um you know she is uh very concerned with social justice and it's cool to see a lesbian character become mainstream um you know obviously uh queer kids don't have uh a lot of they're starting to get more heroes to look to look up to um but that's because of what they're doing in comic books and TV shows and movies and things like this. So getting more representation out there is awesome. Um, I love that we're introducing a Bat character into uh, Arrowverse. Finally. You know, there's there's always sort of like the comparison of Oliver and Batman and how it's sort of a bit of a Batman story. But I love that, you know, that we're finally, you know, now that we have, we have Super, you know, Supergirl and Superman. And now, you know, now we're getting into the Bats. Um, and I, I think it's really cool to be bringing them on. Um, and I, I personally love Ruby Rose. Um, I was a huge fan of her on Orange is the New Black. Um, I think that she is uh, a really, you know, cool actor. I think that she's going to bring some name recognition. Um, a lot of people are familiar with her. Um, and, and honestly, I trust the CW. They have not gone wrong. We've been watching the Arrowverse since... The first episode, pretty much, and of of uh, I think of Supergirl. Absolutely, we we came in a little late to to Arrow. Did we? But, but yeah, but Supergirl but, but Legends since, of Tomorrow. Yes, yeah. but since early on, and I I feel like they have done justice to their characters. Sometimes there are storylines that you know, you know, we don't love, but I feel like the casting of the characters and the way that they're portraying the characters. They've done justice. The you know what they've done with Supergirl, I have absolutely adored um, since the first episode, and the way that they've portrayed her character, and you know just every single bit of it. And I I I trust them, and I think that you know I think this is a good casting decision, but not everybody agrees. Not everybody <laughs> agrees, and we will get to that. Um, you did mention how much uh, that you trust the CW and. Uh, they're not only doing a great job with their superheroes, but they are doing an amazing job with diversity as well. Mm-hmm. Obviously, Kate Kane won't be the Arrowverse's first LGBTQ character. We have Sarah Lance, who's been all over the place. Mm-hmm. Um, we have Alex, uh, Kara zor or Supergirl's uh, adopted sister, as well as Curtis, Mr. Terrific on Arrow. And, you know, side characters and, you know, boyfriends mm-hmm. and girlfriends. And, you know, they've they've done a good job of putting LGBTQ LGBTQ storylines, you know, in the forefront. Um, they're not just, you know, add-on side characters that are there for laughs. Um, you know, these are characters that have a lot of depth, that have interesting stories. You know, Alex's coming out story, I think, was really touching um, and an and interesting way to go with her character and to, to give her, you know, to develop her character. And, you know, I... I feel like that they've, you know, they've they've been kind of coming towards this. I yeah. think they've been moving towards this. They've, you know, dipped their toes in the water with Sarah Lance and, you know, they've just been moving forward and and trying to tell really interesting nuanced stories with their characters and um, you know, give give gay characters and lesbian characters a um, 
you know, a real voice and something for kids to look up to or teens that watch the show. I mean, Ruby Rose herself said that she would have killed to have the kind, to have a, a hero like this to look up to when she was a teenager or a kid. Um, so, you know, for kids that are, you know, in the process of coming out or, the, you know, they're dealing with their own uh, angst about, you know, about coming out to be able to look on TV and say, hey, look, you know, there's, there's Batwoman and she's a lesbian and she's awesome. Um, and, and that's a big deal. It's a, you know, a really big deal. And you mentioned that, you know, they don't just say, oh, hey, I'm gay or hey, I'm a lesbian or hey, I'm bi just for the sake of it. Uh, and any story that is focusing on that, it seems to be a, a major part of the show. Uh, take Sarah when she's first introduced. Um, being, I believe, I, I could be wrong about this, I forget, engaged or very heavily involved with Nissa Al Ghul, mm -hmm. uh, daughter of Rosh Al Ghul. She's got a big history with Nissa. Yeah. yeah, Nissa. And then, um, like you mentioned, Alex's coming out story, uh, very touching, very sad at the end. And then, um, you know, Curtis's story is Mr. Terrific and joining Team Arrow. And, and not only seeing his relationship, but the repercussions of him being a vigilante mm -hmm. and his husband not uh really appreciating that life and you know eventually leading him it's not just a throwaway mm -hmm. it's it's a major it's 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 heavily implemented and very you know serious yeah these stories have the same weight as the straight love stories in the show and i think that that's something that's rare um you don't see that in every tv series that has lgbtq storylines because um you know a lot of times it's a little, you know, it's a little side thing or they don't get a really in-depth love story or, you know, it's it's for laughs or, or that sort of thing. So the fact that these storylines do get, you know, a, a lot of weight and do do really get the same kind of representation as, you know, as the straight storylines is it's a big deal. Now, you mentioned, uh, unfortunately, not everyone's happy about this, and this seems to be happening more and more in Hollywood. Uh, Ruby Rose, unfortunately, after the casting news, uh, getting verbally abused on Twitter, um, quit her Twitter handle. Uh, this is, you know, like I said, this is not the first time this has happened. Uh, Kelly Marie Tran, who plays uh, Rose in uh, Star Wars The Last Jedi, had to quit her Instagram for the same reasons. I mean, what is what is with people, and, and why why does this keep happening? I think these are kind of two different sort of situations um, that are, are kind of related, but kind of not. So on one hand, you've got Kelly Marie Tran, who was, you know, really heavily attacked um, by a lot of disgruntled fanboys, basically, who, you know, didn't didn't like her character, who, you know, said some really awful misogynistic and racist things to her, made threats. Um, you know, it, it was, it was definitely a, uh, you know, a, a pretty nasty attack, um, you know, coming from, but coming from sort of outside of her base. Ruby Rose is interesting because a lot of the criticism has come from people who are LGBTQ. Um, interesting. Did not I, know I th that. I think there's been a bit of both, but I, I'm sure, you know, some of what stung was, you know, the argument that Ruby Rose isn't lesbian enough because she is bisexual. She's also gender fluid. So, you know, her not being just a woman who likes women, but her being a gender fluid person who, you know, sometimes likes men and sometimes likes women um, is, is for some people, you know, they're. They're like, well, it's great that we have a queer person playing a queer character, but why can't, you know, couldn't you find an actual lesbian? Um, there's also the criticism that she's not Jewish because Kate Kane is Jewish. There's so, also... so disgruntled fans and whether so, they're straight or LGBT want a lesbian Jewish actor. Yes. Yeah, I mean, that that seems to be, some, you know, some of the big... I mean, obviously some of these have turned very nasty and that's in part... You know, that's that's why she she retreated off of Twitter was because, you know, it didn't just it wasn't just a debate, but, you know, it became personal attacks and um, and, you know, it became very nasty. And so, you know, she she peaced out, um, which, you know, I don't blame her. The kind of abuse that people give on the Internet, you know, people think that because you have this, you know, the Internet between you and another person that. It, you know, you can say whatever you want and you can attack them however you want and there's no repercussions and 
um, that you know makes it very difficult for celebrities, especially ones you know who have a little bit of controversy that turns into a big, a big huge thing. Um, you know, yes, you know, is there probably a lesbian Jewish actress out there somewhere that they could have found who could play Kate Kane? Probably. Um, you know, there are lots of actresses. There are lots of you know lesbians in Hollywood. There are lots of Jewish actresses in Hollywood. Um, but, you know, the, the argument that you have to be exactly everything to play any character um, starts to become pigeonholing, I think, where, you know, you can only play, um, you know, you can only play this character if you are exactly the same as this, you know, the character that you're playing, um, which I think, you know, is a, is a slippery slope. Um, I, I can appreciate the arguments that, you know, they want the representation to be as authentic as possible. But, um, you know, people get too mired in the details of things and, um, you know, so, you know, certainly there's always going to be detractors from whatever kind of decisions they make in Hollywood, especially around beloved comic book characters. Not only beloved comic book characters, but beloved film characters. You know, it's unfortunate whether it's people of color, whether it's the LGBTQ community, um, white directors and actors. Uh, it, it, it doesn't really matter at this point. I, I would say enough is enough. Uh, you know, I mentioned Kelly, Mir- Ke- Kelly Marie Tran, Kate Kane, Ryan Johnson, who directed The Last Jedi. You know, it's mm-hmm. uh, it's just unfortunate. And it doesn't matter who you are. I think enough is enough. And, and Twitter trolls really just need to go away. Yeah. Yeah. There's a difference between having healthy debate about a disagreement, um, which, you know, a lot of the discourse is. And, in, you know, instead you know, resorting to, you know, racist, sexist threats, attacks, um, you know, it's a, it's a whole different ball game. Um, and it turns into something really inappropriate and it drives, drives people off of social media because it, it gets nasty and the kind of stress you're dealing with, you know, being under that kind of a microscope is, uh, I can't even imagine. You know, I, I was just as excited as you were when I first saw the casting, and I, re- I recently saw a, uh, a fan art, uh, and, and not only, you know, just fan art, but, I mean, you just look at Ruby Rose's jawline, and you look at the <laughs> fan art, man, perfect for that bat suit. I think she's got a, she's got the great look, she's hot, um, you know, I think... You know, having a you know a sexy character is always a good thing. Yep. Um, you know, one thing CW does not do wrong is cast. Uh... <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I th- I think it's the nature of the CW. Good looking men, good looking women. They 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 do a very mm-hmm. good job. Let's end this uh, uh, this uh, segment of the show on a, uh, a fun question to ask here. You were excited that they're bringing the bats in finally, and we're headed mm-hmm. to Gotham City, which is very exciting for me. I mean. Huge bat, uh, Batman, Batgirl. Do, I actually, to be fair, don't know a lot about Batwoman. I know a lot about Batgirl and Batman. Uh, I'm very excited. Now, Bruce Wayne has been name-dropped in the Arrowverse. Mm-hmm. Oliver Queen uh, being accused of being the Green Arrow in an episode and then mentioned, well, you see Bruce Wayne uh, running around. You don't see him uh, in, a, in a bat suit or something something like that, basically mm-hmm. accusing you know two rich people of being vigilantes. Um, are we going to get a run-in with Bruce Wayne. We've seen Superman. I, I think it's something that may be coming. I don't think it's going to come yet. I think with Supergirl, they waited to bring in a Superman. A whole season, yep. They waited a whole season to bring in Superman, and he's still a few and far between, drops in once in a while. And that's as it should be. And it, absolutely as it should be. I mean, I, I think you can't, you know, n- completely ignore the existence of Bruce Wayne. Obviously, he exists in this universe, um, you know, and they're going to be in the same city. But I think I think it needs to be, so it, it needs to be that that kind of a situation. Um, I, I think it's going to happen eventually. I don't think he's going to play a major part, and I don't know how they're going to handle that. Um, so it'll be interesting to see. Um, you know, I've heard kind of predictions that this is going to be sort of a more you know street level. Uh, you know, kind of series, which, you know, they've done a good job of with um, in, you know, in Arrowverse in general, doing this kind of more street level stuff versus the, you know, the big, although they do some of that. Well, I think we're getting enough of the the big bads in Gotham. It seems every single Batman baddie that's ever been created on the face of the planet has showed up in Gotham. So I don't think we need any more of that. that. That is a question is how do they manage Gotham... Well, like how does Gotham, that work? Gotham isn't in the Arrowverse, I so know. That, that's good. 
but it, it's but a, how do they deal with having two TV series that are both having that are both in Gotham and how how does that I, and I don't know how that works rights wise and and all of that kind of stuff so it'll be interesting to see I mean obviously they're not in the same universe um, but to have both of them on the air at the same time is mm, gonna be interesting it's good questions I yeah. can't wait to see what happens uh, we can't wait to see what happens I'm um, guessing that crossover will be sometime uh, mid season so probably uh, winter time uh, both actually sorry all the CW shows come back this October with Arrow, Supergirl, Legends of Tomorrow, The Flash, and I Black believe, Lightning? Uh, I don't know. I should, um, And I believe Legends is not going to be part of the crossover is what I've read. Oh, interesting. Um, so it's just going to be Arrow, Supergirl, Flash. Um, well, yeah. So we'll see what happens. Karen, thanks for coming on, talking Kate Kane and Batwoman. Thank you. Happy to be here. When we come back, we are going to be doing our first reactions to the Transformers collectible card game. Uh, myself and my good friends Chris and Mark uh, did a video demo that you might have already seen. Uh, we'll be doing first reactions when we come back. Stick around. Welcome back to Everything is Permitted, and we are here with my good friends Chris and Mark, and we just got done finishing the Transformers collectible card game that's coming out September 24th. Uh, just to go back briefly uh, to that bumper, that is, if anybody recognizes it, the Scorponok from, uh, from Transformers, the Scorponok sequence. I, uh, I am a Michael Bay Transformers sympathizer. Kill me if you wish. I love those movies. Um, well, maybe the first two. The rest are kind of garbage. Yeah, you're reaching. I am reaching. <laughs> um, so we played the Transformers collectible card game. Um, it was it was it was fun. It was the Chris and I played uh, the first round. Uh, we played the very basic rules, and then Mark and Chris played each other, and played with the more advanced rules. And wanted to get your guys' uh, initial reactions, what you thought of the game. Um, I think we'll skip talking about the the real basic version. And go into what we really thought about, you know, maybe your guys' game and your initial thoughts on that. Sure. So, uh, you know, overall, I think there's a lot of potential there. Um, you know, hopefully we got all the rules right. The rules are actually a little thin at the moment on the uh, Wizards of the Coast website or Hasbro website, whatever it was. But, um, you know, there, there wasn't a lot of uh, strategy for this initial go. Um a lot of the cards didn't really seem to do a whole lot, but you could see where combinations might play out in the future with future sets. Um, knowing that this is a starter, that's probably how they meant this to be. Um, I would definitely think this is definitely a, uh, a set for a person who's not necessarily played collectible card games before or, or uh, even a tabletop gamer. It's definitely light on rules. Um, within the cards and special features and that sort of thing but um overall i think uh i'm interested um i'd like to see where it's heading i don't know if i'm 100 percent sold on it at this point i uh, kind of want to see like i said where it goes but um there's potential there for it to be really cool i would have to agree with chris i think the game has a lot of potential the mechanics of the game are simple enough that uh the younger crowd can start picking up the sets when they come out and playing um but I do see down the road with more cards being released how some of us older players can really start with the strategizing. Um, because we're starting to, even in the starter set, you'll see stuff where if you play this with another vehicle and stuff, and we only have, what, six characters in the Yeah, like six set. characters plus whatever we opened from uh, the Gen Con package. Right, that was an exclusive. and we're talking about a character pool of, you know, there's so much there. <laughs> so I think when we see them releasing other characters, uh, I definitely see how team building... Uh, like you see with other card games, like for instance Destiny, how certain characters will work better with others. Um, the artwork is fantastic. Uh, the artwork on the character cards themselves is sick. I mean, this Optimus Prime Autobot leader is incredible. Um, and the action cards and stuff, it's like the artwork is like almost like cut still shots from like the old animated series, which I like because it's nostalgic. It reminds me 
<laughs> of when I first discovered the Transformers. It, it definitely <clears throat> both, uh, maybe not as much the the character cards, but uh, these upgrade cards that you're talking about reek of the '80s, which is yes. which is fantastic. Which is what I love. Like I said, I like <clears throat> the Michael Bay movies, but that's a whole other story. Um, but Mark, I saw you. I saw you going through the upgrade upgrade cards as we were coming into this segment, and as you mentioned. Um, for those that don't know, we're here at Wade's Comic Madness, and uh, every Thursday night, uh, Chris, Mark, and I, uh, we play Star Wars Destiny, which is another collectible card game from Fantasy Flight Games. It's a bit different. I, I would definitely say it's more advanced. Um, you're not only playing with cards in that situation, you're playing with dice as well. And I guess that's that's my next question. As you go through these upgrade cards and look at them, uh, you got to play with some of them and put them on characters, as did Chris. Um, I guess, do you feel like there's anything missing? Like, do you, after playing Destiny for, you know, however, how long have you been playing Destiny? Uh, since it first came out, so what's that, Same. almost two years? So both yeah. of you have been playing, I've been playing for about ten months. Um, do you, after playing it for, for that long, do you miss maybe rolling dice, or have you have you been in collectible card games enough, going back to maybe Ma- Magic or Pokemon, um, where it's not really a big deal to you? Um, of course, I love uh, the dice aspect for the the randomness, but uh, this straight card games. As someone who's played Magic uh, earlier, we were talking about Star Realms, Ascension, and stuff like that. Um, just straight card games is. I don't feel like it lacks anything because it doesn't have dice. In fact, in the attack and defense, when you're flipping over random cards to see how much damage or how much blocking you're doing. I mean that adds an element of randomness to it, which which, which I like because you don't know how the battle's going to go. Yeah, and that's also like looking down the road. Um, that could play out in the way you deck build as well. Yes. The the consistency between the defense and uh, attack uh, modifiers when you're doing the card flips. So, you know, I think at this point, like I said, like um, down the road, I can see potential for all these things to play off one another. In the starter set, it's hard to say what's missing because it's a starter set. It seems to have the basic upgrades that you need. I've seen like a couple things that increase damage. There's a couple things that increase defense. Um, you know, when Destiny came out, it was a lot of those basic type of things where uh, you know it was basic weapons, some uh, basic uh, events that sort of remove dice or remove cards. Didn't see a whole lot of that in here. I don't know like what the what the equivalent would be in this game, but you know, just basic sort of functional, basic rules, uh, actions, and upgrades. And I think that's what we're getting a taste of here. Um, I do, like, I I am very curious to see, like, you know, to put it in Destiny terms, what's the equivalent of, like, uh, like Darth Vader as a character, or let's say, um, what's the big upgrade from the first set? Like, uh... Uh, Ancient Lightsaber was, was huge. Yeah, like an ancient lightsaber, or or in the very original Awakening set, there were a few upgrades. I'm blanking on them at the moment, but you know those like was killer Force upgrades. Lightning Awakenings. Sorry, Force, Force Lightning? Lightning. No, that was in um, Spirit, I believe. Well, like but, I, I, like right out of the gate, flamethrower. It gives you that ability to flip two extra battle cards when attacking. And on a on a beefy character, you know, you were you were talking about you know a possible Darth Vader card. Uh, this promo Optimus, uh, if we can actually find him, uh, yeah, he's a was beast. has the potential for a card that they were giving away. He's a uh, a twelve star. You have a total of twenty five stars in your uh, in your characters. Uh, pretty beefy. He has six damage right off the bat and uh, fifteen health. Uh, in his alt mode, which is his eighteen wheeler, he only has one defense. But if you turn him and go full prime, he's got two defense. He's a pretty beefy character, and he's got that bold ability, which out of the gate gives you two more cards to flip over so you're attacking with four cards instead of two um i want to i want to talk more about upgrades here in a second but um i i want to touch on on the dice aspect a little bit and just share my thoughts i've only been playing destiny for 10 months and you know i I don't know as much as how i I don't want to say broken but i feel like every game at launch like destiny has its flaws and i i from what i've heard awakenings at the start was was pretty flawed um I don't necessarily think I missed the dice. Um, I played Magic as a kid. I haven't played in years. I also played uh, the Star Trek collectible card game, which was a lot of fun, and that didn't have dice. Um, I like I like that you can do these flips. I think that's mm-hmm. that's pretty neat. Um, I I do 
I do feel like it's it is missing something. And then before we go into maybe talking about the upgrades some more, um, I guess that's my next question for you guys. We played again the basic round. You guys played a more advanced round. After playing that more advanced round. Is there anything that you think is maybe missing that you'd like to see without also fully knowing what we're going to be getting on September 24th? Yeah, I guess like more thematic weapons, honestly, would be very cool to see at yeah. this point. Um, I don't know, like Optimus's blaster, you know, like iconic sort of everybody knows it when they see it yep. type thing, like that sort of stuff. Like going back to the Destiny, you know, there's like Luke's lightsaber was in the Awakenings. Um, it wasn't. It turned out not to be that great of a card in, in the long run, but I mean, iconic stuff like that would be awesome. Like the Matrix, yeah, in some capacity, whatever that may be. You know, um, there's some keywords on the cards you see, like you see, like leader on Optimus Prime and, and Optimus Prime and things like that. So perhaps, like you know, maybe, maybe the, there's not much information what that leader keyword does, but you know, you can envision where the Matrix of Leadership comes out. And it's given to Bumblebee or whoever, right. whatever character you have, and it gives them some advanced ability. So, in my eyes, that's the stuff I would all, I would like to see. Um, and and you know what the the other thing that while I'm talking about this occurred to me is like, the, and Mark brought us up earlier. There's so many characters and so many variations mm. on the history and the different generations of the Transformers. There's Beast Wars, you know. There's there's G1. There's all these combinations, and it would be neat to have like. Yeah. Beast Wars, Optimus. He was a gorilla, right? In in that one, I think so. And yeah. Optimus, you know, old school uh, tractor trailer. Yeah. Going, you know, as as a pairing, you know. So yeah, I mean, so I think like iconic <laughs> stuff is more what I want to see, you know, and references to those iconic things that we all know and love from the series. Yeah, I would agree with what he said, and I, I was even thinking as I was playing, it would be cool if they added support cards. Like, for instance, like the, uh, I forget his name, the T-Rex, and stuff like that. Oh, like those Grimlock. Larger, Grimlock, yep. Yeah, Grimlock. You know, those, some of those larger uh, Transformers uh, that we can play, where they're not necessarily your characters, you're back and forth, but they're support characters. Uh, you know, like the way you can play ships in Destiny and, and, and mm -hmm. such. Like, I think that would be a good idea. It, well, we got to talk about the elephant in the room, those tokens that they give you. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> or, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that on the 24th, uh, apparently there's more stuff uh, coming out from Hasbro, and apparently Ultra Pro is releasing some cool Transformers and stuff. We're not just stuck with these uh, little... Uh, if, you, if you watched our demo video, uh, you saw them, these little piece of crap white cardboard... I mean, you could bend them in half, and it's useless, I, I would say. So either hopefully we get something better, or, uh, hey, all those creative people on Etsy, uh, all I'll say is get to work. For me, um, I felt like what's missing, you know, you go to Gen Con, it's a big gaming convention, and they're doing the starter set. It's going to be available, I think, in uh, next week on Hasbro's website. But I, I was disappointed that it only came with Autobots. If you're doing a starter set, I mean, what better than to do Optimus and Bumblebee versus a Megatron and a Starscream. I mean, that's what disappointed me. Mm -hmm. I mean, right now, the only the only Decepticon we're looking at is Slipstream. He was on the cover of the Gen Con exclusive pack, and that was it. And that's the only Decepticon that we've seen. Um, I, I think that was disappointing. If you, if you guys got a brand new starter set, you know, I, I would imagine you'd be pretty disappointed as well. Yeah, well, I, I would have been nice to have a balance. So that way, if you like, you know, someone wants to play villain versus hero, that would be cool. Or at least have one of each. Like this is obviously the Autobot starter set, right? Like to not have the Decepticon starter set out right. at the same time. Maybe they will. So you're thinking, it, you're thinking that you know this is really like the most basic starter set. Yeah. This isn't like the the Destiny two player game where you're getting mm -hmm. a Luke Ray. A, not, a, I'm sorry, not a Luke, a uh, a Ray deck and a Kylo deck. This yeah, is strictly almost, for Autobots, and they're going to strictly do a Decepticon one. I almost feel like this is like the original Destiny starter that came out, not the two player game. That was Ray, and yeah. then there was a Kylo set. Oh, that's right. They were separate um, sets. Yeah. yeah, and they both sort of were thematically hero and villain at the time, but you know, it was it was definitely uh, focused two focus sets. Like, from my perspective, like I'm probably gonna buy the starter, probably gonna play it with my son who's 11 who loves Transformers. Like, Autobots versus Autobots, same right. starter yeah. sets <laughs> doesn't seem as appealing yeah. to me as having one of each, you know, faction right off the bat. Um, it's kind of interesting that 
that's not happening or or maybe it is and we just haven't heard about it but um yeah looking through the action cards that they give you like there's they're not specific to decepticon or autobot and i'm thinking maybe down the road you'll see cards like that where you can only play those upgrades on whatever faction you're playing mm -hmm. and we still do have that that um that factor we don't know what the the white symbol meant we know that if you draw blue that helps your defense and orange it helps your attack but there are a bunch of these cards that have white on them um, and there was nothing, as far as you were concerned, Chris, that you saw in the instructions about that. No, I didn't see anything in the, the advanced rules that were on the um, Hasbro site. Mm -hmm. um, I did watch a few uh, playthroughs from Gen Con, and I, I believe that white may trigger an extra card draw when you're doing the flip. Okay. Um, but I didn't see anything official in the rule book, so that I'm not sure of. Uh I think it was Mar Mark or Chris. No, Chris, you mentioned you know you're gonna you're gonna probably pick up a starter set play with your boys. Let's talk about the age here because uh, we were talking about this before we started recording. Uh, right on the box, pretty big letters, eight plus. This is this is clearly a game that can be picked up pretty early. I mean, I even believe that you know maybe a six or seven year old could pick this up with enough enough knowledge. Um, do you think that this is something that? adults are really going to pick up on with games like Magic still somehow being as big as it is with Destiny on the rise, or do you think that this maybe will be a fad for a few months and then not be successful? What do you guys think in there? I mean, I think it's tough to say at this point. Um, it, I mean, it is interesting, when you even when you look at the art styles, right? It's like the G1 stuff, which us old guys are familiar with, and then there's the newer art, which my 11-year-old probably... It's more familiar with from the comic books and some of the newer cartoons so it is kind of like they're trying to split the audience it's almost like they're trying to hit the parents with the kids mm -hmm. who are in the transformers now and the you know the parents who were in it when they were the same age as their kids so it's interesting i, I mean i personally would like to see it get dialed up a bit in complexity and i'm hopefully like this the sets that come out do that i mean I, maybe that's not fair to say because this is a starter and entry level piece but um you know, it's a great IP. Yeah. There's never been, a, as far as I know, like a real CCG for Transformers. Nothing like this, as far no. as I know. Um, Mark, you, you know, I, I see your boys almost every Thursday, uh, and you, you play Destiny with them. Um, and they're they're older than eight. I, I'm sorry, I don't know their they're ages. 12. So they're 12 each. Do you think that this might even be too basic for them? Do you think this is something that they would like? Um, They would like it. I mean, it's. I don't think it's... It is basic, but again... Like Chris said, we just don't know until we see more cards. I mean, they did make it easy enough that an eight-year-old, or like you said, even a six, seven-year-old could pick it up. But uh, I think we'll have to wait till the more cards come out because this is going to be one of those games where you're going to build a deck and you're going to bring a deck to compete with. Uh, so strategizing is going to come in. You know, tactics is going to play a big part which my sons love you know building a team and putting something together to outthink your opponent or outplay your opponent but based on this core set that came out i i don't see it uh so I, i'd have to wait till i see the next batch that comes out to say is this gonna yeah for kids absolutely i don't know at this point if it's going to hold the attention of adult players and it's kind of interesting, actually, because I think when Destiny, we keep bringing up Destiny because we, we play it a lot. It's what, you know, we're junkies. What, we are 100% yeah, Destiny, Destiny junkies. junkies, that's right. But I think that's a lot of the same stuff when Destiny first came out was the same thing. Like, oh, these big color blocky dice, like this, yeah. you know, the starter sets are basic. It's not very interesting. Yeah. And, I mean, we look at it now, it's blown up pretty heavily, yeah. I would say. Uh, depending on who you talk release. to, you'll see some people on message board saying, Destiny's dying, Destiny's dying. And then, right. you know, you're seeing, you know, 30 to sometimes 40 player store championships and some of them have been low some of them have been high but no the game's not dying it's it's getting more popular all the time right and i mean just to watch that sort of how that evolved over time you know the first set came out and once people were actually able to get product the word got out oh this is actually a really good game a lot of st strategy involved here we know it's dice it's random but that's just part of the game like there's more to it than just that and it, maybe this is where this is going to head mm -hmm. um I mean, I would like to see it successful. Um, I love Transformers. Uh, yeah. I would too, obviously. Yeah. Same, yeah. you know. And I'm not. I'm not a Magic guy. Um, my kids like Pokemon, but I'm not playing Pokemon. Like, I'd much rather play <laughs> like a an IP that you know. Again, like maybe that's their goal here is like you know hitting on that IP that um, parents and their kids are older. You know, ki older kid. You know, 
Well, I mean, you know, you know, you're, you're on point though, yeah. because there's, you know, you, you have you have the standalone Bumblebee movie coming out, which I think is going to be more aimed at kids. Uh, it, it doesn't come as any shock to me that this is coming out very soon mm-hmm. uh, on, I think, the heels, or it's it's about to happen of the original 1980s movie coming back to theaters for for a run real quick. Um, I, I think they're trying to build something here. Mm-hmm. Um, we only have about another minute to go, so before we wrap this up, I want to ask you guys. Um, you know, we've seen these upgrade cards. Going into September and beyond, if this does become big, uh, what card or what kind of card would you like to see most come into the game? And Mark, I'll start with you. Gosh, what card? Well, uh, you know, going back to what Chris said, more significant, like Optimus Prime's weapon, uh, more more specific weapons or stuff that we, even like what I said about upgrades would be cool. Uh, like a, play an upgrade like a Dinobot to support your team would be cool. Constructicons. Yeah. Oh, Constructicons, yeah. <laughs> I would like to see how they how they interpret that sort of... Well, it's like, you know, there's a couple of those. There's uh, the Constructicons, there's like the aerial bots, there's, there's all those robots that turn into a big robot, Voltron style. Oh, yeah. I would love to see that that mechanic worked out in this game somehow. Yeah, and for me, um, one thing that I, I saw that was significantly missing that uh, I liked about Magic when I played as a kid and what I like about Destiny, even though it's not to as much of an extent, is um, mana and battlefields. I would like to see locations. I mean, listen, you know, uh, Cybertron is mm-hmm. a major part of Transformers, and Earth, to be fair, is a mm-hmm. major part of Transformers. Um, I would like to maybe see some battlefields. I mean, there have been some epic battles in Transformers, mm-hmm. and I think that would be a really cool thing to bring into the game. Do you guys think that's something that could work? Yeah, that would be interesting. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you see how it works in Destiny. Yep. You know, something where you come to a game, bring a battlefield, and, you know, it's going to either support or wreck the other team. Yeah. <laughs> or have an element where you could swap battlefields in the middle of battle would be cool. Yeah, some kind of environmental mm-hmm. effect of some sort. Yeah. Yeah, it would be, would be interesting. Well, guys, I really appreciate you coming out tonight. I appreciate you guys doing the demo uh, for people to watch online. That'll be on, uh, well, it's already on Facebook and YouTube. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Coming up next on the show, I'm going to be talking with my good friends Rick and Matt, and we're going to be discussing the massive influx of streaming services uh, hitting all your devices and how that adds up to cord cutters, if it's something that's going to be a pro or con moving forward. That's coming up next. Stick around. Transformers, more than meets the eye. Autobots wage their battle to destroy the evil forces of the Decepticons, the Transformers. Welcome back to Everything is Permitted, and I am joined by my co-host Matt Reppert and my good friend, and who's going to be one of our, uh, what did we call it earlier, Rick? Regular contributor. Regular contributors here on Everything is Permitted, Rick Salvi. Uh, Rick, welcome. Matt, This you haven't recorded with me yet. Uh, no, no, I haven't. Welcome. No. Thank you, thank you. Uh, our main story tonight is on the uh, the influx of streaming services that we've seen hitting all of our devices. You know, Netflix, Prime, Hulu. Uh, I think we can all agree that those are the big three. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Recently, we've had CBS All Access come out... Uh, majorly for Star Trek Discovery, uh, as well as for cord cutters, services like PlayStation View, Sling, to name a few, and then others that were, I think, just announced at what uh, San Diego Comic-Con with uh, DC Universe and the yet-to-be-named Disney streaming service. I guess the question is, the biggest question is, with these streaming services, we're so used to watching on on netflix and amazon prime uh i personally don't have a hulu account is there is there becoming an oversaturation of streaming services is it getting to be too much i honestly don't know at this point but i would say that i think there are too many of them in that a lot of the shows like if you want to watch the expanse you have to have amazon prime if you want to watch show A or show B, you need to have their streaming service. So there really is no unified way to watch all of your shows. Uh, I'm, I'm also kind of in the camp of I'm not totally sure yet. The thing that does seem to be happening, though, I feel like is content is being made exclusive to certain platforms. 
And in my personal feel, feel is that that can be a bad thing long run because, like you, I don't have a Hulu account. And, you know, there's certain things, you know, that I would like to watch on Hulu, but it's... Yeah, like, I personally, like, I would love to watch Handmaiden's Tale. I, yeah. I hear that's an amazing show. And I, I do want to talk about the the point that you made mm-hmm. about exclusivity because that is, that is a major focus of it. Uh, before we get to that, I do want to ask, talking about oversaturation... A normal cable bill these days, if you want all the channels and a lot of the ones that you're not going to watch, can be anywhere from $120 to $200 even. Now, with Netflix, keep they keep raising their prices. You know, I think it's $11.99 now, and I think it's a little bit more if you want 4K. And then Prime is $129, uh, sorry, $129 a year now. And then they keep getting add-ons. This is a, a nerd podcast obviously uh but it's it doesn't hurt to talk about the fact that espn plus yeah. just came out with a streaming you know oh sorry espn came out with espn right. plus mm-hmm. and that i believe is 4.99 a month so you start adding these up 11.99 9.99 9.99 i think for hulu uh maybe some, more some, some, like something that. along yeah. that and if you're cord cutting a service like playstation view it just starts to add up. And if, if you don't have HBO, if you don't have cable, you have to sign up for HBO now, $15 a month. Yeah. Does this create a problem for cord cutters? You know, they've just cord cut, but then maybe they're starting to pay $150 again just for yeah. these streaming services. Well, well, I mean, I know I read an article um, about a month ago where I forget what company it was, but it was down in Texas. They were basically doing a trial run of uh, if you have a cable package you'll get faster internet speeds. But if you had cut the cord and just had internet, they lowered your speed. And, you know, obviously people lost, you know, lost their stuff because basically now a company is saying, well, if you don't want to pay for the cable package, we'll just slow down your internet a little bit. So your cord cutting thing won't be as lucrative. To and, you. and that's, that's a whole nother story. And that gets worrisome, especially not, not to get too much into politics, but what's happened recently um, with net neutrality, that yeah. could become a, a major big deal. That I think that is a story for a whole other yeah, show. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Rick, did you want to touch on on uh, the cord cutting bit? Well, I mean, not only can you cut the cord with streaming services, but you can have uh, things like YouTube TV, which isn't cheap. I think I pay pay thirty five dollars a month for that. Oh wow! Um, I'm actually considering canceling it because I barely use it. The real only function is to watch live TV and have a <clears throat> have a DVR. You can record anything you want onto it. What are your What are your channel t- uh, Sorry, your channel options with YouTube TV? Because I hear it's it for if if we're talking about PlayStation View and Sling, and I think DirecTV now is a new thing. And then you're talking about YouTube yeah. TV. What are you getting? Right, I'm. You get all the local channels. You get all the standard, like USA, TNT, Sci Fi. You get uh, some international channels, um, BBC America, you get BBC World Service News. Um, The channel selection isn't as large as what you would get on a real TV, to be honest. There are also add-on services, which I've experimented with, but always ended up canceling the next month later. Like you would have ESPN Soccer, which has its uses, but it's also the most expensive package they have. I think it's nearly a twenty dollar a month add on or a fifteen dollar a month add on. And do you get all leagues, or you, do you just get MLS you get all with leagues. that? Okay, but it's one, one or two, only one or two channels. But it's soccer and rugby, twenty four hours a day. That I mean, that's nice. But again, it, it we're talking about a significant amount yeah, more money, basically. A significant amount of money, absolutely. So it's almost arguable that cord cutting isn't as viable maybe as it used to be well i wouldn't use the word viable i would say you have to be a smart you have to consume well rather intelligently in order to cut the cord in a cost-effective manner um you know my wife and i have considered cutting the cord we still have the cable package and all that but you know i'm kind of in the camp right now of like all right if we cut the cord you know how are we going to watch the shows that we watch how you know, how many different streaming services I'm going to need to get my hands on? How much is that going to cost? I mean, 
Because at the end of the day, I mean, just throwing out a round number, if you pay, you know, like $150 for your cable package, but then you end up paying like $150 for all your different streaming services, and you're still spending the same amount of money. It just comes from several different sources. And, you know, I, as I said, like I'm, you know, I, at, the, at the moment, I enjoy the convenience of kind of having everything centralized, all my TV shows. I can watch, you know, Better Call Saul and have it recorded. I can watch, you know... I can watch The Expanse on the Sci-Fi Network, have that recorded, and it's all in a convenient location where if I have all these different streaming services, like, up, oh, I can't watch this on Hulu, I gotta go to Netflix now to watch the show that I want to watch, and so on and so forth. I didn't put this in our notes, but I think it's, it's something important to talk about because, Rick, obviously, you and I talk about it a lot. You're a huge fan of The Expanse, and Matt, you watch it as well. A lot of shows that have been canceled on regular TV and cable networks uh, have been that have been getting canceled. Sometimes have been now getting picked up, exactly. like The Expanse. For me, like Longmire. Now, I was lucky enough to have Netflix already, and Netflix bought I think two final seasons of Longmire, which is a great show. Yeah. Now, yeah, me, I'm lucky enough. I already had a Netflix account, but people who maybe watch that show on A and E maybe don't have a Netflix yeah. account. Maybe they didn't sign up for one, so they didn't get to finish the show. So it's... Would you say that it's a blessing and a curse for it these is. shows to be picked up? Matt and I were talking about this earlier in the case of The Man in the High Castle. On Amazon, it's exclusively on their streaming service. You cannot buy DVDs or Blu-ray. A fantastic Pop. show. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. It's a fantastic, fantastic show, show. But you cannot, at this time, buy any DVDs or Blu-ray copies. And, and a lot of these streaming services do this differently. Netflix does release them on DVD eventually, yeah. but it's a very long delay. Uh, CBS All Access, luckily for me, uh, is releasing Star Trek Discovery in November Good. on oh, Blu-ray. Okay. So some of these streaming services are making physical right. copies uh, available, and some are just either delaying it significantly or not doing it at right. all. Matt, you were talking about this before we started the show, and I think you wanted to talk a little bit about that, about... The, the advantages of maybe having a physical copy over um, streaming or a digital copy. I've always been a fan of... I like to physically own a copy because my my thing is that I can't fully ever trust digital. And I've had experiences, and granted this is not exactly the same thing with in regards to digital purchases of video games and things like that. Because um, like uh, when I had an Xbox 360, for example, I purchased a remake of uh, Turtles in Time, which was a fantastic <laughs> old game. Yep. You know, I grew up playing it in arcades and stuff like that. That was a wonderful arcade. Game. Yeah, and I purchased it on Xbox Arcade. You know, years ago, I bought it, I played it. You know, had a lot of fun with it. And then I found out that the license for music that was used in the game ran out. So basically, Xbox pulled it from the store. So if I ever delete it from my hard drive that I still have, it's gone forever. Even though I purchased it. Even oh, though, that's ridiculous. Even though I own it. It's like there's no refund. There's nothing. And there's I, no... You, you don't get like a re-download link? No. You don't, wow. you don't get anything. And I tell people like, yeah, obviously times have changed and things like that. But that's always in the back of my mind when, you know, I buy things digitally only. It's just like, you know, at what point, you know, what does a company owe me when I purchase something? Because if that company goes out of business or gets bought... Or something like that, because the person who buys them could be like, "Well, we're not honoring that because you didn't buy it through our service; you bought it through them." And you know, maybe the, a deal will be set up, but you can't always trust that. And... Matt, I'm I'm very much with you. Um, not so much with games anymore. I do like buying games digitally, but as far as as movies are concerned, uh, I'm still having a hard time completely transitioning to digital. Mm -hmm. I like screw Best Buy and screw Target because they've totally they've totally <laughs> sucked me in with their. They're amazing steel books. Yeah, um, I, I, and, I, and I'm 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 suckered in, and I love them. Uh, Rick, preference? I can go one way or the other, but for movies, I prefer a physical hard copy. However, if the movie is available in 4K in a digital format, I will buy that Same. instead, because I do not have an Ultra HD Blu-ray player at at present. Um, but you can stream most right. most streaming boxes have 4K right. capability and now. For shows, I much prefer to stream because just out of an OCD perspective, <laughs> box sets take up a lot of room. Oh yeah, yes. absolutely. Yes. And not only that, I was reading an article earlier about 
season four of The Expanse, how the showrunners were saying on Amazon they will have less restrictions on the content of the show. Specifically, they said they would be easily, like on sci-fi, they would replace fuck with forget. So there's a scene where Holden is yelling at a character saying, on, on the on the sci-fi version, saying, forget you, forget you. But on the real version, the one you buy or the one on Amazon, he's, he's vehemently yelling, fuck you. Fuck you. And that's very much the same thing, Matt, we watch this on. I don't know if you do, Rick, uh, The Magicians. Yeah. Uh, you, could say, you could say shit on cable TV on pretty much any network now, yeah. but you still can't say fuck. And I think on, whether it's Netflix or a physical copy, all of that is put back in with its real mm-hmm. language. Yeah. Which, which, to be fair, cable networks are getting better. And again, that's that's another subject for right. another and day. They also, talked of, on television. they also talked about how they wouldn't be limited to 43-minute episodes. If they wanted to, they could make hour and a half episodes for like a two-part special. They could make a longer, much longer feature film-length episode if they wanted to. They also said they didn't have they would wouldn't have many restrictions on things like nudity or uh, what was the other thing? I think that was it. Nudity. Um, Those are usually the big two as far as the, yeah. the cable networks. That's not HBO or Showtime. It's it's nudity and language. Yeah. Well, uh, and maybe some drug use. Well, something mm-hmm. that, that Rick and I were talking about uh, earlier before we started recording was the idea, because The Expanse, like, I own physical copies of it and, in fact, digital copies of the first two seasons. I haven't bought the third one yet, but I will. Um, now that it's been picked up by Amazon, is Amazon ever going to release a physical cop- copy? Because, you know, as we said earlier, like, Man in the High Castle has never gotten a physical release. And honestly, I don't even think you can even now, purchase it. Amazon, unless... unlike uh, the Man in the High Castle, Amazon... Well, Amazon is Man in the High Castle. No, but for The Expanse, oh, okay. the production rights are actually with Alcon Entertainment. Do they, so they get to decide whether I there's think a so. It's Alcon Entertainment that's still. It's just that Amazon's funding them, as far as I'm aware. Well, and I, I and I feel like in a situation where it, there's already a fan base and there's already physical copies out, it kind of changes the game a little bit. You're you're almost required to it. Well, I, I think this will. I honestly think that this will kind of be new ground that they're breaking because this I is honestly, the first time they've picked up a show. Well, I can't. I mean, I can't think of other shows. No, that I have can't. Been, can't no, I mean, I can't like either. there was a whole spate of them that got picked up by other networks or streaming services. By the way, damn you, Netflix and Amazon, for not picking up Designated Survivor. Damn you, damn you, Grease. Yeah, I got to watch that. Oh, so good. I, I really was. I interested was sort in of pissed it. how no one picked it up. I mean, it ended on a huge spoil. It ended on a huge <laughs> yeah, cliffhanger. No one picked the show up. It's ridiculous. Uh, let, let's move on uh, to something that Matt brought up that is on our notes here. That is, um, I think, a hot topic that uh, has been talked about and that should be continued to be getting talked about. Disney is is the big name in this specific situation is basically going to be pulling everything from Netflix in a probably like a year or two like and that. putting it onto their new streaming service. Now, what's ridiculous about that is that again, you're dealing with multiple platforms. Is it better to pay a little bit more per month, so maybe like let's say 15 or 20 dollars per month per month for one or two services? And these companies can put on their big boy pants and work out deals. That, I mean, that, that has to be the better situation. I mean, at the end of the day is that my personal feeling is that, like, yes, they can work out deals. But the thing is, times change. Things shift and all that. Because, you know, like, would anybody have surmised about two three years ago that Disney would have been like, oh, we're going to pull everything from Netflix. I mean, because that's something that had crossed anybody's mind. So... You could work out deals where Disney could say, like, oh, yeah, you know what, Netflix, you can still show all our Star Wars stuff. But then two years from now, Disney can be like, you know what, we don't like you guys having that. So now we want exclusive Star Wars stuff on our streaming services. And, you know, my my personal feeling with that is that companies can are just like people. Sometimes they can break up and there can be things that come between them. I guess I guess where where the only reason I think it, that Disney will be successful with this is because they have they have the viewership and they have the power and they have the success. There there have been no bad Marvel movies. There have been ones that are much better than others, but there hasn't been a bad one. Last Jedi is probably the only thing that they've done that has been mired in controversy. That's about it. So they can be successful. Now we're talking about 
DC Universe. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Saying, oh, hey, hey, Disney, we'll do a streaming service too. Yet, the DC Universe can't get their shit together. Their TV, their TV universe is fantastic. It is. It is fantastic. I don't know. Titans look set to break that. Well, up. that's what I'm getting at. <laughs> Have they learned nothing? That preview for Robin made me want to throw, or sorry, Titans, made me want to throw up. I mean, have you not learned your lesson from Man of Steel and Justice League and Batman vs. Superman? All of this dark and brooding, people don't want that. They get enough of that from Game of Thrones, okay? That's where they want to watch it, not not in their, in their comic books. Can it be anywhere near as successful as as Disney's new streaming service. Mind you, it's not just going to be the dark and broody stuff they're getting. Any animated thing that DC has ever made and any future DC thing is going to be made. Matt, you had the biggest laugh, so I'm going to let you go first. I mean, my thing with DC is that they they don't like to have fun with their properties for the most part, it seems. Like, they, as you said, they go this dark, broody route, and I mean... I watched the trailer for Titans, and the moment that Robin appears on screen and starts flat out murdering people, and he breaks the guy's neck, and then says "fuck Batman," I I was done like with the show. I have no interest in watching it. And I watched the original Teen Titans cartoon, even though I technically was probably too old for it. Yeah, I I really enjoyed it. It was for kids, but it was very adult, and that was that fine line that they walked. Where, you know, it's it's a kids show, but you can enjoy it if you're an older person like myself. I have not much to say about the DC Universe and their streaming service or their potential streaming service. Uh, I've never really been a DC Universe fan, well, movie-wise anyway. <laughs> I think that could be said for, for a lot of people of us, right now. Uh, more of a Marvel guy myself, so I really can't comment on... But, I mean, y- y- you have to imagine that you're just, they're not going to get the amount of sign-ups based off no, of... No, it's, it's, it, it, it's not going to work. because and the, and the funny thing is, is that because Marvel has the whole thing with Disney. So it's not just the Marvel well, movies. Well, forget Disney. They just bought 21st Century Fox's Well, uh, yeah, and now, and now Disney essentially owns Hulu, I believe it is. The they... alien queen is a Disney princess. <laughs> 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 that is a thing now. <laughs> I mean, to me, the smack like the DC streaming service just smacks of like, oh, we need to match them blow for blow, rather than like, let's just focus on doing what we do better than them, and then and we can worry television. about that. And that's it. Well, they're 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 CW shows. Yeah, yeah, and it's, I mean, and it's a shame because honestly, I mean, when most people think superheroes, they think Batman, they think Superman, they think Wonder Woman, they think these. Basically, these gods. Yeah. And I mean, don't get me wrong. Like now, Marvel has certainly intruded on that. But honestly, if you say to me, like first superhero, and you know, you know, think of it like I'm gonna that, go Batman. Yeah, you're gonna go Batman. Yep. You're gonna go Superman. You know what I mean? And yeah, I love and Wolverine. Iron Man. Wolverine's my favorite superhero. But if someone says pick a superhero right now, Batman. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that's and that's the thing. DC still has that, and they just have not been able to capitalize on it. They've gone that grim dark stuff, which just isn't working. And Funny enough, out of all the trailers of stuff, I was most interested in Shazam <laughs> because it looks <laughs> like it's, looks fun. it looks like they took the idea, they're having fun with it. Yeah. They're like, "All right, you know, it, I mean, it's a kid who says the word Shazam and becomes a superhero. How serious can you really make that?" Like so, I mean, like Shazam, I'm hoping that's kind of what they go for from here on out. It's like, all right, let's just have fun, guys. And I feel like the the upcoming Wonder Woman movie set, set in the 80s, mm-hmm. I feel like you just can't make a movie that's dark and gloomy based in the 80s. Yeah. Unless it's Tim Burton's Batman. <laughs> <laughs> Final question here. We talked about it briefly just a few minutes ago, but it's it's the big one. Will people keep honing up nine ninety nine a month or more for five or six different streaming services, or are people going to start signing up for cable again? I personally think that at some point there's going to be a re- there's going to be a revolt because I, you know, because I if, if you go on you know social media, which take that for what it is, but I've seen a lot of people comment about Disney's potential streaming service of like I don't want to pay for another streaming service and. You know, and the thing is, is that the streaming services are kind of incrementally increasing their prices by a dollar or two, you know, every few months or something like that. At some point, you know, when you're paying 15 or $20 a month for, 
you know, access to Hulu. And I mean, as much as you might enjoy it, you know, bills might be tight or something like that. And you're looking for something to cut out. And, you know, it's much easier to cut out that thing that has like maybe two or three shows that you really yeah. love. And like, mm-hmm. oh, I'll, I'll turn to piracy or something. I'll download it or. Which is exactly what they're trying not to do. No. Yeah. Like, for example, I said earlier, I'm really considering cutting YouTube TV. I barely use it. Now that I only used it so I could watch The Expanse live as it aired, and now that it's been saved and transferred to Amazon, I mean, on occasion I'll watch BBC World News, but I can also stream that as well in audio. I'm pretty, yeah, yeah I, I have the BBC app. It's funny enough, we're such nerds. Um, <laughs> I love the BBC World News app. Yeah, the audio, it's just, amazing. I, I, I but, only need the audio for like, it. Not only YouTube TV, but I'm considering cutting Hulu. Well, half considering, but there are at least uh, four services I'm signed up for for streaming. So it's you know the the big three, and BritBox. Okay, so is, I, I take it BritBox. You can watch all of the good old British shows, yeah. classic Doctor Who from 1963 to 89. Are you being served? Yes, <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Humphreys is not free. Yeah, I mean, I, before we wrap up here, you said you have about four. Uh, I, honestly, I have Netflix and Amazon. I don't have a Hulu account, and that's uh, so. I have Netflix, I have Amazon, and during when Star Trek Discovery is on, I have CBS All Access. With Star Trek Discovery season one, they proved to me that they could make a good show, so they got my money. Um, I won't say how I watched the first few episodes, but yes, I, I paid you CBS. You you took my money, but I I canceled. So think about that. There you have it. Some have four, some have two. It's starting to add up. That is our show for this week. Matt, Rick, thank you. Two weeks from now, our second episode of Everything is Permitted, we are going to be talking about phase two of the X-Wing tabletop game. Also, IGN just released a, well, their opinions. We all had uh, some laughs about this earlier. Their top 25 superhero movies. We are going to debate that and tear it apart. That's in two weeks on our next episode. Everybody, have a good night. Fire rocket to the moon. Fire to the rocket. Fire taxi to the airport. Fire front door to the taxi.